Welcome everyone to SEO Office Hours. My name is Michael Chidsey. I'm an SEO here at Good Signals. And part of what we do, along with special guests, are these office hour sessions where people can jump in and ask their questions around their website and web search. By the way, there's nobody in the hot seat and we might not know all the answers, but multiple heads thinking about a problem should help. As you can see, we have a bunch of questions already submitted, but if there's anybody here live on the call that would like to ask any questions, feel free to flag yourself in the chat functionality, which will be monitored. Also, there's usually a bunch of other SEOs live on the call. Please feel free to share your perspectives. I think that's one of the best things about SEO office hours. Isn't just the four of us, but it's everybody else. So please continue to do that. Like every week with me today is Search Engine Land Search Marketer of the Year as of this week, Joe Juliana Turnbull. Morning, Joe, and congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks very much, everyone. Yeah, really pleased to to be a winner. I never won a competition before or an award, so really happy. And thank you, Mike, for the nomination to it. So I was very humbled and I feel very grateful and honored for that. So thank you, everyone. I'm really happy to be back. Also, I'm available for work. My family's health is much better, which is great. And so I'd like to maximize the working time that I have. Uh, and I'm looking for a job as a growth marketer, combining my sales and marketing experience. And I'm looking to work for a SaaS finance or fintech brand. So if anyone's looking for some help, let me know. I know it's not the easiest or best time to be job hunting right now. So a good time to win an award, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope so. Yeah. Silver cloud on every lining or silver lining in every cloud. Thank you for setting up this SEO office hours. We are nearly at our one year anniversary. That's actually next. This today is our 46th episode of SEO office hours. So thank you everyone for joining and supporting us. So hello, Preeti. Hello, Umama. Hello, Frank, Rob, Monse, Simon, Walid, Albert, Olu, Watobilova, Emily, we have Boran, Jordan, Albert, Aino, Igra, Daniel, Nishant, Benjamin, Albert. Just trying to see if I've said it to, to everyone. Lisa, Ian, thanks so much for joining us today and always um, being with us. Many of you guys are regulars on the show. And I'm very pleased to have our two special guests here with us today we have erica and john thank you for coming on our 46th episode thank you for having me <laughs> i'd like to introduce firstly erica so erica is a growth marketer at a company called trust mary she leverages her experience in seo strategies to drive organic traffic and business growth and very impressive over the past two years her role has evolved from writing editing content to more of an seo focused approach and so she's generated over 28,000 signups and more than 1,000 paying customers to Trust Mary only from organic traffic. So very impressive stats, Erica. And she's also recently wrote about SaaS SEO for Sitebulb and in for Women in Tech SEO. She's a very busy person. She self-taught herself SaaS SEO or SaaS to be a SaaS SEO marketer. She has the background in intercultural communication, linguistics and teaching. She's also got an inter interest in conversation analysis, learning the skills and finding different ways, innovative ways to handle these repetitive tasks. That's been a key to her professional mm -hmm. development. Uh, so Erica, you've done quite a lot of different things there. How did you get all the time to do that? Because you seem very busy. <laughs> That's a great question. And thanks for the very comprehensive intro. I'm just a very energetic person. That's it. I, I love to learn new things and I'm very enthusiastic about things. And when I'm at work, I'm always ranting about the things that I feel are very important at this moment. So just being really enthusiastic about things helps get things done. And also you said that you were an avid knitter as well. And also you have two very uh, strong-willed daughters, which is great. Good to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. One needs to have a really strong will, especially as a girl in this world, to speak up your mind. So I'm very happy that they're strong-willed. <laughs> very good. And John, he's a freelance digital strategy and growth consultant. He's based in Southeast London. He's actually been a longtime supporter also of Search London. He works with a diverse range of clients from startups to the FTSE 100 brands. And his expertise spans various different types of projects, like he could be doing 
website migration, or then he could be setting up Google ads accounts. So he's a lot of experience in different elements of digital marketing. But before he went freelance, he worked in-house. He worked as head of growth at Lion Little World Beverages. He oversaw all the digital strategy for different craft beers. So I think really Johnny would be person to come to if we, we have some questions about what beer we could go to, to have for some parties or to buy for ourselves if in the UK. But you're also an avid cyclist and you travel around to different destinations across Europe and Spain, Barcelona. And you've also have two wonderful kids too that keep you very busy. So welcome to SEO Office Hours, John. Thank you. Well, that's quite an introduction. I wasn't sure how to follow Erica's actually. That um, was quite some achievements there. Can't knit. <laughs> I, can, I can cycle. It sounds like you've lifted half that from my LinkedIn page as well, which actually sounds quite good. So I'm, I'm quite happy that I've, I've put all that on there. It makes, makes sense. But thanks for having me. I must add, you, you might have noticed from the schedule that I'm probably not the, the planned speaker. So I've been drafted in. I do have to potentially leg it at 10 o'clock. So if I slide off at 10, don't worry, guys, nothing's wrong, power cut or anything. I, it will be a planned exit. But I'm checking my email. And with any luck, I can stick around. So thanks for having me. And let's get stuck in. Yeah, thank you very much, John and Erica. We're also, we've had a few other people join us. John, we think we had Rob, we've had Jiraj join us. If anyone has any questions for our speakers, please, as always, write it in the chat. Over to you, Mike. Super. And if you hadn't noticed already, there is an SEO office hours in Espanol starting on Thursday. So if anybody can speak Spanish or understand Spanish, if you check out Danny and Carlos, Danny was on a few weeks ago on SEO Office Hours, you'll be able to join them. So I think it's Thursdays, 11.30 Madrid time. Cool. Okay, let's jump straight in. And thank you again, John, for last minute joining. Unfortunately, the person that was meant to be here had some really sad news. They had to cancel last minute. Okay, first question. Important for SEO. Hacked and detected warning received by Google in Google Search Console and a manual action has been applied. It says if issues like this aren't fixed, they can lead to reduced display features, lower website rankings, and even removal from Google search results altogether. It seems that it's a hack subdomain redirecting to a streaming service for a sports match. What should we do? This is extremely important. Sounds important. Has, has anybody been in this situation before? John, you're nodding. Yeah, I have actually. I remember what we did. It was quite a crafty hack. The client, one of my clients now actually, they had an old subdomain where they, they didn't use it anymore, but they'd left the IP. The DNS was still pointing to an IP address that didn't ha have anything there. So the hackers essentially spoofed the, the, the IP. They were able to, to ba basically start ranking content on that subdomain because the DNS still existed. It was just simply a case of filling the gap. And it was quite a clever set up and I picked it up off I had my crawl was, was set up and it was Ahrefs picked up to all domains when I noticed all this stuff coming in so it was quite easy to pick it up obviously the client was pleased but the way we solved it was to act very quickly but ultimately you got all this stuff in the index and if you looked on the search console you could see pages not indexed it was every day that went by it grew by we had hundreds of thousands of pages waiting to be indexed and they were landing in the index so what they'd done was they basically created a site map with hundreds of thousands of variants and it was working its way through and they had a dynamically rendering it was an spa or some kind of setup so it was very clever in that this would scale forever so we had to look at the dns but we had to serve our own server message status response to to any http request i think it was a and gradually as google recrawled those urls we had to leave the sitemap in place you have to kind of enable Google to, to revisit those pages and to realize they're not there and gradually they, they drop back off. And I think the, the immediate reaction would be just to switch everything off. But the, that, that was the best practice that did actually work. And it took a few days to, to get this thing set up. But gradually over the course of the next three months, you, everything cleared down and we were able to shut that server down, clean room the, the DNS and, and just get everything removed and, and there, was, there were no impact there. We were lucky to catch that before we had any uh, penalties or actions on our primary domain. But yeah, quite scary. When you're faced with all this, all this stuff, all of this spam, you're like, wow. And, and you've got a high traffic website to try and protect. So the fact it's got that far and they've got the action is there on search consoles. They need to act pretty quick. 
Great. When you said it was pretty clever, I thought you were going to start telling us how to uh, hack domains and <laughs> redirect that. Um, I mean, it, I think it was, yeah, I don't know. I think their solution was very clever. Yeah. But it was probably for an engineer, it was probably a few hours' work knocked together an application that was able to dynamically render pages. It was the concept that I found quite clever, just really gaming Google's index and how to rank. I think the ranking, it was book titles, it was like student book titles. So zero search volume stuff. They knew that they could rank for about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, these terms, but all of these pages ranked would then link off to their own domain. Anyway. Great. Erica or Joe, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that was a very comprehensive answer. Thank you. I do have a couple of messages in the chat, unless you want to say something first, Mike. No, go for it. Yeah, so Simon said actually he had the same with the client subdomain on Shopify, the new domain that had never been used before. Shopify don't tell you it's been set up. Uh, they added the redirect. They added the redirect to the subdomain to the main site, and they also complained to Sup Shopify as well about this issue, but didn't respond. Simon, then what happened really afterwards? That's, that sounds terrible. John was saying that his ancient site got hacked on a subdomain that wasn't used with some affiliate links. He swapped out the affiliate links for his until he had more time to lock it down. Very smart idea. Yeah, I've, I've had this before with um, clients. There's a university client that I work with that they, a, a subdomain of theirs, somebody had hacked that and was selling Instagram followers and you find things like that happening all the time. And the best thing to do is a bit like John said, you can full turn those pages and just shut it down, basically, usually from experience with manual penalties. Uh, usually when you get those things, once you've fixed it, you can actually say that you can ask Google to review it. It's so usually when you get those sort of notes, so there'll be a button to say, has it been fixed or review or something like that. Usually when they send messages, it's all quite clear there. So once you've done that, I would then follow whatever steps are in that message just to make sure you give Google the nudge. Yeah. Okay, great. Anything else in the chat before we go to the next one, Joe? No, we didn't. Okay. Next question. Our devs want to rebuild our site structure to accommodate the natural growth and changes of our website and business. Following last week's love of spreadsheets, that was Chima talking about spreadsheets. Do you use them to map out a suitable structure for this kind of project? Has anybody done anything with kind of website structures and planning them out? John, you're nodding. Are you happy to start yeah. with this one? I should have learned this by now. If I show any kind of emotion, I love you. I'm done. <laughs> You're there. Um, yeah, I've done a bit. I think pretty much any website you get to work on requires some kind of restructuring. And it depends how complex and how kind of messy things are. I did work on a project that actually you're familiar with where the requirement was to overhaul structure. And it was whilst I think there were SEO objectives there, it was more of a user experience thing really and, and it's quite a nice example because i know we're, we're always told to think of the user trying to be mindful of how that's going to look in the eyes of search engines but we, we had quite strict regulatory pressures they're working in the financial sector funds and investments in a specific sector i won't say any more than that but the regulators were hot on their heels to make sure the right information was being presented properly with that in mind we went through quite a, an extensive of analysis and, and review to work out what we had on the site, to work out what we, we needed on the site. And then we used a process called tree testing and something called card sorting. And there's various pieces of software that enable you to do that. The tree testing is where you pull together a website navigation and it's a very basic skeleton structure. It's literally text in little boxes. And th the ideal way to go about that is to recruit people potential users, people within your right demographical target audience, and, and you interview them and you have them use this piece of software to organize these navigation items in, into an order that they, they feel is appropriate. And the, similarly with the card sorting, we would have, it's about grouping. What's your kind of intuitive feeling to, towards where something should be? Do you, know, do you understand what these labels mean? And it's very time consuming. The outputs were, whilst I think right at the start, we had some ideas of what it should probably look like. And it's easy to walk into a website and go, that's what it should be. Let's do it that way. Actually, we ran through these tests 
The outputs were very interesting, but they did, they reflected a lot of what we were already thinking. However, we then had the data, we had the evidence to go back to the client and say, look, this is what we think it should look like. And I think that was quite an effective way of re- restructuring yeah, it's, what, what was quite a big website. Yeah. Yeah. So for that particular project, so the card sorting side of things was about, like John said, grouping different types of information and finding out how somebody would label it. And I think we used a tool called Optimal Workshop, but there's also Useberry as well and some others where you basically say what the content is and then you, without giving away too much like leading and allow people then to give it names and labels and so on and where it should appear and if it should appear and so on. And then the tree testing element was basically taking those labels and putting them in different places based on how people had grouped them and then you would give them scenarios so you would say to people if you were looking for x where would you expect to find that and then using this very basic skeleton like john was saying they would then use it and find it and it was really helpful in terms of other in mapping kind of tools i've used a tool called dino mapper which if you're thinking outside of spreadsheets are also really fine by the way but dino mapper is quite useful because it basically crawls a website and it will give you a visual representation of that website and you can move things around and so on so that can be really helpful i think just watching people on your site with things like hotjar microsoft clarity that sort of thing can be quite helpful and then if there are any vr geeks here like me one thing there is a really cool app called noda where you can basically import a sitemap from a website into your space or into a virtual space and you can walk around the site and move these nodes around and links and so on that's really cool and if you have that i definitely recommend erica have you got anything to add to this i actually love spreadsheets cool Um, pro spreadsheets and we have used those to organize for example when we have redesigned our menu so we map out what we want to have there and then we give that to our designer who is then going to make how it's going to look like. And then we can comment and make edits based on that. But first we need to give some context to our designer, what should be there and what should not be there. So it's been like, we use Figma. So you can there move those labels also like sticky notes. So we've also used spreadsheets and then Figma, and then the designer will do the actual design on it. And then we will move forward from there. Yeah, I would definitely start with spreadsheets first. Because then you have it like in an organized way and really simple. So you don't get confused of what were you actually supposed to do at that stage. Um, For what it's worth, those tools that John and I were talking about before, actually the output is a spreadsheet (laughs) with all it. So you can spend ages on these really cool tools. And the same with Noda, this VR thing, you basically send it, export it, and it becomes a spreadsheet. So spreadsheets are totally winning. (laughs) Joe, have you got anything to add? I do spreadsheets and it's a nice way of organizing. So Google Sheet. And then, yes, I've used Figma as well then to map it out if we don't have the designer there. Of course, I'm not a designer, so then they can obviously make it more pretty. We've got a few comments in the chat, which is great. Simon's talking about pen and paper, pen and paper, big old sheets of that to scribble it down. Or he uses a mind mapping program, which can be handy. So one is called Simple Mind Pro. These site taxonomies can take some time, but it will also evolve as well over time. Albert's talking about straightforward information architecture with help, spreadsheets, John's saying spreadsheets. And while he's saying, what about keeping a notes on the wall like you do, Mike? <laughs> you know, I think that's quite a nice little tip. But I would also see if you have time, why not get a feedback group? You know, see what mm-hmm. people like after you've done the initial design or outline. So so it feels like we've mostly spoken about it from a user perspective, just to put my um, pure SEO hat on. I'd also just be thinking about what makes sense in terms of the content itself and and the pages themselves. And if it's a huge website, I'm not the biggest fan of having just like a total flat structure. So I try and group things that make the most sense and prioritize those important pages. That's just how I would do it from an SEO perspective. Any, obviously... I think use doing it from a user and an SEO perspective makes sense. And there's so many crossovers. Would anybody else like to add anything in terms of if you put your pure SEO hat on or are you happy with the answers? John, you're no. not again. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree with all of that. I think with that, that particular project, we had come at that as SEO. So we've already pictured this kind of hierarchy in pen and paper. Absolutely. I think we'd probably formed an idea of what we wanted to do. And the tools were 
there to help support that. But yeah, absolutely. If SEOs are involved on a website project, the, the objective there is to in, in, increase and sustain traffic. And the way to do that is to absolutely look at your topic clusters, making sure you're properly linking pages, that you're addressing the topics thoroughly, semantic addressing keywords in that sense and just doing a really thorough job to make sure you're doing a, a, a cracking job for the user there but the, the tools were a nice kind of thing to, to also play with not a, I'm not a, a UX specialist Nilsson Norman was the authority on usability check him out it's got an entire online school of content and there were some fascinating videos that we were able to get some learnings yeah I think what what the tools did was they automated the process in terms yeah. of you could recruit 500 people to this thing and get the results in a day. We did a mixture of that. And we also did face-to-face -face interviews and stuff like that with people just to get a bit more context around the why. Okay, great. Next, uh, next question. Is it better for a blog section of a website to be called blog or news, or can it be named something else like stories, campaigns, or YOLO? Erica, what do you think? It highly depends on your users, again. So how do you think they will best find your... Is it resources? Would that be better? For instance, I think Sitebulb uses resources because that is essentially what it is that they do for people. They give you resources. So think of how the user would potentially find you. And then for a local business, if they write about personal experiences and, and whatnot, so then maybe stories would actually be more comprehensible for the user so basically just knowing how your customers or potential customers will find that how would you like them to find that on your website so i would just go with that great john do you agree anything else to add? nailed it yeah that's it what's the most in thing for your users I, i'm not a big fan of the word blog but half the internet is put using the word blog but yeah updates resources b2b audience might find something a bit more formal the, the YOLO, why not? If that's your audience, maybe that works because it's quite possible that actually you're ranking article pages. And I'm not sure whether the word blog or articles or resources is going to have much kind of impact on that if you're doing a great job with everything else. But yes, I'd, down to your user and who is on your site and, and where do you want them to go? Great. Joe, any thoughts? Yeah, some people are saying that the blog is a bit generic, like Monse and yeah, Preeti as well, too generic. Daniel's also saying it depends on the website and the audience you're targeting. Albert's actually put together what we could do. So Albert, you're suggesting resources and under that you have blog, articles, news, research papers. Don's talking about it's the categorization of what's in the blog or resources or whatever that matters most. Uh, name depends on the tone and content of your website. Yeah, Simon's talking about call it soup and John's do average users still know what a blog is? It's developed so much. Yeah, I would say summary is depends on your users really. Great. Yeah, I, I think you can overthink these things and chances are in a year's time, if, if you're thinking about giving your blog a name, chances are in a year's time, you might end up changing that anyway. I would be tempted from a URL perspective to just keep it really simple. And like Erica was saying, basically just keep it simple and describe what it is and what makes sense to the user. But if you want to call it soup or cheese or whatever we've had, go for it. Why not? <laughs> okay, next question. Would you recommend adapting your title tags to match the most successful ads from your Google Ads campaigns? Would you recommend adapting your title tags to match the most successful ads from your Google Ads campaigns? What if these ads drive visibility for terms that your site doesn't naturally rank for, even though they lead to the same content? Anybody take an information? Erica, you're nodding this time. Would you like to take that one on? I think especially if you don't rank for those terms, organically like what's the harm in changing those titles i think that's a brilliant test that you can do like that's just brilliant because if it is already serving the user like they're clicking they're coming to your site from that ad i think it would actually make so much sense to change that to the organic and seeing how that performs there if it has an impact on the rankings itself and then maybe later on if you start ranking with it if the performance is as good or better or worse, like just aligning paid ads and SEO better is also something that we need to work on as a company. But I think this is a great test 
And I, I think I might try this personally. I think it sounds really intriguing. John, what about you? Would you take your best performing ads and change your title tags? Yeah, maybe. I'm still trying to understand it. I'm thinking, so from the ads, we're we're basically talking search terms that are driving traffic, and then we're going to use those on title tags. I think potentially if they're, depends on traffic volumes and things like that. I think a lot of those, especially where even exact match on Google PPC is more, more close variant these days. And there's so many, I think there was some stats somewhere, like 80% of all searches are brand new searches that people have ne- never made before if you're yes absolutely i think it'd be a, a great test it's definitely something worth testing but it depends on the traffic behind it and what's right for the user and you know how big is that change going to be how many pages are we talking if your page is, is optimized for organic search chances are you're gearing the url around a more of a topic than a pick again depending on what kind of traffic forecast you've got do you have enough ppc activity to warrant actually swapping all of those out yeah maybe something to test but yeah i can see some kind of merit in that if certain ads are driving a decent volume of clicks everything's different every domain's different every audience market's different yeah so so the way i understood this question was because there's two parts to it one is basically do you take the most successful ads and i was assuming that was from like a click through rate perspective the actual text itself used in ads and change the title tags. But then the second part was basically around, and also if you see, like you were saying, John, search terms appearing that you don't currently rank for, should you then optimize for those terms? I, th- I think, yes, you could test and see, I guess the, the thing when it comes to the search terms is obviously you're paying for that, like you're choosing to target those particular terms and so on and sending that traffic to that particular page. So from that perspective, the reason why those search terms appear is because this person is paying for those terms in some way. Um, And if you think those terms are relevant, you don't necessarily need need to optimize that particular page. If it's totally different, you could create pages for those terms. Yes, I would 100% go through your search terms report and see what, what you're getting impressions and clicks for and seeing if you can basically create some content around that. In terms of updating your title tags, Again, you're paying for those ads to appear. So you could take ones that have high click-through rates and look at changing them. However, if, for instance, your title tags currently have your keywords in and things like that, and these don't, then that might impact SEO. So from that perspective, you might want to test it and keep an eye on it if you do change it. Joe, do you have anything to add or is there anything in the comments? I would just say it's a lot of people were talking about testing. So I mentioned that as well. But we're just saying great insights, Eric and John. He will be testing, trying that with his project. Umama gave a good point. It could improve the relevance of content to search queries. But mm-hmm. of course, just check your search queries report. And Amansi is talking about testing is everything. I also wanted to say a welcome and a hello to everyone that's joining us, not live, that's watching the recording. And if you are enjoying the show, which I'm sure you are, click a like on the video and subscribe to the Good Signals YouTube channel. And of course, if you would like to join us as an audience member, please subscribe to or sign up on the Good Signals URL, goodsignals.com for us, SEO hyphen office hyphen hours. Only only a few more sessions until the end of the year. (laughs) Where has the year gone? Okay, next question. So we get this sort of question quite a lot, actually. So there could be some previous office hours. It might be worth having a look at some of the answers so what steps should we take if we have thin or low quality content on our site um erica how do you fancy kicking off on this one yeah it depends on what do you mean by low quality is it grammatically low quality then improve that is it lack of depth is there no links to it like no internal links or no backlinks to it or No traffic. What do you actually mean? Or there are no expert quotes on that. But before you actually even go into that, I think the first question you need to ask, is this business relevant? Is this an article I should pay attention to? Or is this an article I should just move away from my website? If it's thin content and it brings you nothing, why would you improve it and spend time on it if it's not even business relevant? So first up, I would start by checking what is business relevant and then moving into analyzing it. And maybe when you do an analysis, then grouping things like these need expert quotes, and then you can bulk 
optimize those in some way and then or no internal links you can bulk optimize those as well so grouping those different issues together so that's what i would do first so business relevancy is key will this drive something what is the goal of this piece top of funnel top of mind thing is there a conversion related to that or is it only to drive traffic and why would it only be that and like thinking of the bigger picture before starting to spending time on it great john do, do you have anything to add uh, no, I, I agree i agree entirely yeah it'd be easy to grab the secretaries and just start kind of chopping stuff off but absolutely before you do that i think the analysis is so important why is it thin is it actually thin is it low quality is it thin as erica rightly put there is it serving another purpose i think what i often see is where websites will have a blog of an article resource subfolder full of pages that have been built to support a social media post and they're all garbage there's just hundreds of them and a lot of websites have this so you can pretty much cut all of that it's not doing anything for anyone it's buried it's gone and nobody's looking at that but search console is your best friend here crawling tools that can tell you what keywords are potentially there what's doing what is it thin is it low quality is there potential to cluster stuff? You know, has it been overly optimized? You have 10 thin pages that you could bring together to make one decent page. I, I think analysis and time and maybe starting from the beginning, what's the whole purpose of the website? What's the domain doing? What are your pillar pages? What should those clusters look like? And where do these pages fall into that strategy? Do we need to know index stuff? You've got PPC pages in there. Why are they indexed? You don't have to index everything on your site. You might find by chopping 100 pages off the site, you're left with 100 pages that suddenly find some authority and actually start to perform a bit better. Or you could chop 100 pages, website traffic slumps in half, you plan that out badly, and then you're like, where's all my really high quality traffic gone? We want to do the second one, then do we? But, you know, who knows? Yeah, not my website, but an analysis. Be very careful, but plan, prepare, and take action and have some confidence in, in your strategy. Yeah, that's very good. Very good point. Both have raised um, some excellent points, but in terms of the plan to prepare and also have the confidence, I would also say, make sure that you also are, if obviously with a larger website or a larger team, make sure that you're communicating what you're planning on doing, because you could say that these pages aren't driving much content, but somebody might have a personal like love of those pages. They wrote it. They want to let go. So before you chop, or get those secretaries that, as you said, John, I would make sure that you are very transparent with what you're planning to do and before you actually do that. And Erica, sorry. One thing uh, to always remember, for instance, we have a, like an outbound sales organization as well. It might be some of the pieces are used by them or by our customer success team. So also it's a really good point that you need to communicate. So you need to make sure that no one else is using that piece internally. Like it's easy to put it back out there, but they might also not notice that they're sending links to customers, which are not working, not mm. taking the resource. So there's the SEO part of it. And there is the not SEO part of content as well, because not all content is actually for search engines, but for users. I'm not going to get into that now, but <laughs> Can I add to that? very good point. Please. Yeah, sure. I think that's an excellent point. And that's generally with clients that I work with, you're often trying to teach them. You're trying to educate them on an ideal world. You, you want to recreate yourself and, and eventually move move away. That's the proudest moment is where you, you train somebody to handle that. But one of the first things I, I try to say to them is when you're building new content onto a site, what is the purpose of that? They just stick stuff on there. Does it serve a purpose? And what is that purpose? So like I gave the example of social media, if it's for social media, that's absolutely fine. Go ahead and build that. But does that need to remain on the site? Does it need to be indexed? How is it PPC? Probably don't want to index that. But what is the purpose? Okay. Is it a blog? Are you trying to rank that for? Or is it a, a landing page? Is it a client page? So as long as it has a purpose and you know that, and uh, yeah, don't don't prune stuff that somebody else might be using. Very good point. <laughs> so we have some great recommendations in the chat as well. Once is saying, find it if it is thing, then Erica's ideas are gold. But Simon's saying often you get low quality content on these sections like the category pages because they're just a list of posts. So these can be easily turned into 
topic hubs. Very good point. John saying yep, yes to everything that you say, Erica. And we have also educating clients. Yep, that's a great point. That's mainly our role. But educating clients, yes, very important to do that. And just in terms of the thing content pages, yeah, I would just make sure that we've got everyone on board before we actually delete it and be very clear about which ones that you want to get rid of. More communication is always better than none. So don't just think, oh, this email is fine and I can delete it. Maybe have a meeting about it. Great. I, th I think um, just on the category pages point, that's what I often see with larger websites. Say it's an e-commerce website and they've got pages that have, say, been dynamically created. Often I find they're the ones that lack content and just have essentially a filtered product grid. And so what I'm often doing is thinking about ways that the client or I can evolve it for them. And when I'm thinking about that, I try and think about what can I do at a time? So it might be to add a particular module or something like that, rather than need to do all of them at once. Because I find with this, if you're trying to do everything at once, you won't get anywhere. So if you put a plan together and maybe think, okay, I'm going to add a description or something like that to these pages, I would just focus on that first and then focus on adding FAQs, whatever it is you want to evolve those pages. Um, often just looking at other competitors or other companies um, that are either in your industry or in similar industries can be really good in terms of inspiration and just capturing that in terms of ideas to evolve those thin pages. And I agree with what everybody said about content in terms of like blog posts and information. Yeah, just thought I'd add a little bit more on the categories and, and those kind of subcategory pages. Great. Anything else? Or should we next question? And we've just got 14 minutes left. So thanks everyone for joining us today. That's joining us live and also joining us at watching the recordings. As I said, we've got our one year anniversary next week. So make sure you tune in. I know it's a holiday in some countries, first of November, but Mike and I will be here. Of course we will. <laughs> it's actually a holiday in Spain, isn't it, Joe, where you are? next yes, week it yes oh, amazing okay since i'm responsible for copy and i report to both the head of brand and the growth team how can we better align our brand and copy guidelines with seo requirements given that the language often doesn't suit both do you have any examples of copy that maintains a strong brand identity while still performing well in google oh good one erica yeah, yeah, you've done what John does. Sorry for taking all the questions. Go for it. The linguist in me is, is there really a huge gap? Like, how can there be a huge gap between SEO and the brand? Is the brand trying to do something which isn't, that's not the way they are going to be found? Like, when you take any keyword, that's how people look for that information. And when you try to go against it, it's weird. Like in this position, I would have the teams come together and actually ask these questions. Like, how do we want to be found? And then is the language matching? Like this whole question is like, how can this be? <laughs> also, um, we are a relatively small brand. So we don't have these type of silos. We have a really small marketing team and we can do everything in a really fast and agile way and test and iterate. But I'm just really curious. What do you guys think? What, is, is there a huge gap? Is, is this a question that I'm misunderstanding or? I think, okay, I'm sorry, I was just going to say that. I think sometimes like brands are very protective of the brand. And sometimes like some brands, it so it depends obviously who this person, who this company is. Sometimes they don't like to always say, uh, maybe who they are. They don't like to use the words that we would use in SEO. I found between the SEO and the brand team at some agency, or some companies I worked at, very misaligned. You know, I, I don't know why is the case, but they didn't want to use certain terms that would actually have a higher search volume, for example, and, and that people would be looking for. They wanted something different. Um, John, what, what are your thoughts? It's very polite, this show, isn't it? We all agree with each other. I haven't heard <laughs> one. There's no disagreements. I actually do agree. I agree with all of this. I've worked with one client that mentioning no names. There was a massive disconnect between what they wanted to say and what they should have said. And it was quite political and it's quite hard. And that was quite challenging. The, the example you've got here, I know job titles. I don't know who this company is. But if the fact they've got head of brand suggests that there's a team beneath them of brand people and a team of growth people. So this sounds like quite a big, I've worked with some seemingly big companies that have a marketing team of one, 
when you've got a team of 10, it's either a very well funded or a very, very wealthy company, or, or it's a very big company. And I can imagine the wheels falling off there where it gets quite, quite political there. I don't think, I think the question here is, do you have examples of copy? I'm sure we could d- dig through case studies and find that kind of stuff. But I think this is one to really get under the skin of what is that language and to find that kind of middle ground. If you're using funny language that isn't recognized by users or search engines, there's no kind of growth there anyway. It, it depends. My question really is that will it resonate if the target audience comes to the website that is written like the brand manager or a director or head of whatever wants it to be, will it actually resonate? Because those aren't the words the person themselves would use to find that solution. So that's why I'm like, how can this even be an issue? But then again, I work for a small company and we don't have those silos. So maybe if I move on to corporate world, I will understand this issue better. So, so I, I've been in this kind of situation a couple of times with clients where they've got brand teams or people that work in more general marketing, and then they've got the the search side or the, the digital marketing side. And often it can be down to things like maybe they've got internal language that they've created or they've trademarked or something like that, where, for instance, the first company to use the term Froyo for example, would have had that constant, we would call it frozen yogurt until that kind of caught on. So from from that perspective, some companies have a strong tone of voice. MailChimp's a good example of that, where they share their guidelines and they um, want to be friendly and approachable, innocence the same. And so actually, from their perspective, their brand is really important. And that tone of voice comes through on the copy. And so I think where I've had to negotiate or try and compromise with people that work in the sort of brand or marketing side is actually identifying which of those pages really matter from a a search perspective and actually what parts of those pages um, really matter. And you still want it to feel like that brand. Therefore, it's still important to have that same language and you want that consistency across the the site. But there'll be other pages that, that, that are there that don't really matter from a search perspective and it's more from a user experience and actually that's the whole kind of user testing and so comes through because it's important that people like erica was saying you want people to understand what you're saying and it resonates but yeah that's usually the way i get around that is compromise and negotiate and say look this is a page that matters from an seo perspective so i need to protect this a little bit and we just need to call it frozen yogurt we can't call it froyo on this page for example, might be um, the, the thing. I think a good, ex- uh, uh, and regulation as well is another thing that comes in that sometimes, although people are searching in a certain way, um, because of the industry you're in, you might have to say something in another way um, just because that you might have a legal team or some sort of regulation where it's clear that you have to name something. But I think a really good example is the IKEA website. I think they're, they've got a really strong brand and tone of voice, but they rank really well for things like sofas and beds and corner sofas. And I think they've done a really good job of having that consistency throughout the website, but they've got those kind of key pillar pages. They've a bit like on the last question, they've evolved, they're really good. And I would just look for those. If you want examples, I would just go and find some industries you're interested in, go and Google some of the more generic terms and have a look at their websites and see if there there are any that have done that. Yeah. Okay. That's my thoughts. Do do we have anything in the chat? Yeah, we do. And yes, love IKEA. So Preeti saying that I don't think there should be a difference between the SEO content and content that actually helps users. Same as obviously what you said, Erica. Yes, we don't think so either, but um, some companies hmm, might disagree. Umama is talking about collaborating with teams, keyword research, and optimizing the content may help. So yeah, probably might be a good idea to actually have, if you can, some internal meetings together about keywords and why you want to go extra for some as opposed to others. Focusing on metrics like impressions and rankings in search can be misleading. It's possible to just gain the numbers without providing value to the business. We have, in my experience, Simon saying that growth or sales team, they often ignore these brand guidelines. Yes, it is true. We've done that too. Because they do hinder their targets, companies need to all working together and not be federated. But as John mentioned, corporate politics can get lethal. The concept of performance monthly saying can be flimsy from a business perspective, we want our content to rank, but is it bringing any good leads or conversions? This is one reason why it's difficult to know whether 
the competitors are actually doing it well. Yes, good point on that one. Yeah, so some good interactions there. And yes, question six, we have four minutes left, Mike. Yes, I was just going to add, actually, I think one thing we always talk about on SEO office hours is when you're trying to rank for something, also having a bit of a point of difference to everything else in the search results. And I think sometimes your brand can be that point of difference if you've got a certain style. So I think it can also be a really good thing. And also sometimes when, when I was talking about compromising and getting the brand team to compromise, it also works the other way that sometimes we have to, and that actually for them, it's more important to stand for something or, or use the language that they've created and trademarked and so on. So yeah, it works both ways. The final question is our regular question, which is basically, what are you most excited about from an SEO perspective? John, what are you most excited about from an SEO perspective at the moment? Wish I'd prepared something. Uh, um, I'm, I'm excited to see his, his what's his stance on AI. Initially, it was it, with it, it, one of excitement that he figured it would solve more problems than it would create. But now he's recently come out as flipping down his head saying he's worried about how dangerous it's going to be. And he's quite an influential character. Really, it was his company that kind of funded a lot of this so i'm quite curious to see how that will pan out i find that quite interesting and we all love a bit of ai in some capacity so yeah do you know what we've not really cut we had a few ai questions as well as you can see there were loads that we didn't get through i try and prioritize them each week but we didn't really talk about ai today but good point erica what are you most excited about from an seo perspective i'm actually most excited about seeing how the whole industry will develop in the upcoming years because of the AI enabling more and more companies to jump on because they think it's so easy to produce content, but then you actually need an SEO person to optimize because just having content isn't enough. But I think it is also making the whole search market situation harder to perform in. So I think, especially in Finland, because we are a smaller market, there is now more enthusiasm um, within the SEO community that we need to report on, not on traffic numbers, but on actual business numbers, like how we impact the bottom line. And I think, and I'm hoping that everyone is going to invest more on SEO when SEOs will report more on the outcomes of what it is that we actually create. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how reporting business value will change the whole SEO industry. A large topic, but I'm super excited. I was recently at a SEO face-to-face -face meeting here in Finland, which is really rare. There's, these don't happen often. And that was the talk of the day. Like, how do we report on these metrics and boost the whole credibility of this industry? Because it, is, should, it should be seen as a strategic investment for all companies to future-proof themselves like for the upcoming years and to drive like actual growth for the business. Amazing. Search marketer of the year. What are you most excited about from an SEO uh, perspective? Oh, thank you very much. I'm always excited about events. And I do want to <laughs> say that we have on crawls first, their search on is doing a first technical SEO workshop on November 25th. We'll share it in the in the description and learn about all your tech SEO because the thing is you can't be good at everything. But if you can come to some workshops or some online events, it does help you if that's an area that you want to get into. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Loads of great. Oh, thanks. All the messages in the chat. OK. Thank Simon you. says you're good at everything. <laughs> he, is. he is good at everything, he said. It's half past ten. Thank you so much to everybody for joining. Uh, thank you to those watching afterwards. Thank you to our speakers. Joe, thank you for co-hosting and thank you for those that submitted questions. We will be back next week, which will be our one year anniversary of SEO Office Hours, which is cool. Thank you so much and see you next week. Thank you, everyone. And for what it's worth, we won't be doing anything differently next week. <laughs> see you later. Bye. <laughs>